So an article came out in the New Republic this week called Blue Exit, a modest proposal for separating blue states from red, and it's by Kevin Baker. And so the piece itself, this particular piece, I want to say it's satire. It comes across as satire to me because it's a little bit overblown. It makes a lot of points about how Democratic Party was asleep at the wheel. They were trying to convince their electorate that the Republican Party was this fringe party that was going to go away and that they had, you know, everything in lockstep, I mean, everything locked down. And functionally, that blew up in their face and they lost, uh, you know, 1,100 seats over the course of eight years. And but, the, you know, a larger thrust of the piece is that the red states are living off the teat of the blue states, that they're like that they are, in fact, suckling at the federal, you know, the federal government's wage as a lot to be paid by, by blue states. And, you know, sans context, it's a satirical piece meant to like illustrate a lot of issues with the discourse and how we break down things in blue and red and how like the perception of red of, you know, Republicans as, you know, being federalists is kind of a joke. But, you know, we, we can't separate that from the context that this is a conversation people are actually, are actually having, right? That people are talking about specifically that, and I recall Dan Savage said it's on Real Time with Bill Maher, and by I recall, I mean someone told me because I don't watch Real Time with Bill Maher. If you're on Real Time with Bill Maher in 2017, you're a piece of shit. Casual reminder. Yep. <laughs> if you've ever been on Real Time with Bill Maher, <laughs> I mean, like, we can't just put a 2017 cap on that. I mean, like, that guy's been shit forever, but that's... Right, that's digressing. Bill, Bill Maher's been shit for a long time, but like, but like, as of 2017, let's say mid 2016, because I, I believe I believe in being generous. If you're on Bill Maher, if you're in real time with Bill Maher, you're, you're a piece of shit. You, you gotta stop because Bill <laughs> Maher's only Bill Maher's only power is that he can platform people, and that's why that's why he gets away with a lot of bullshit. Unless you're there just but, to so, yeah, tear him down, maybe. But, but like, but this this is the conversation that people are having, you know, now at least especially liberals, because you know Marcos Melitos was having was, was known for trying to like you know make fun of the cons- people dying in conservative states for whatever reason and to me like it to me it's indicative of again sour grapes right that the democratic party does just is not prepared and the liberals are not prepared to actually like wage this ground war against the republican party and that some of them do want to pack up their bags and leave but blue exit is problematic for so many different reasons and i'm going to open up the floor to get your you know and get everyone's impressions about the idea of the democratic party you know i'm sorry democratic parties going forward this what i want to say is a plan to emphasize on urban areas and to like again to like the just to divestment of rural areas etc cetera, etc cetera. so john what do you think about no, it's a sure it's a sure way to lose every single state house and every single governorship in the entire country which will then give the Republicans a sure, um, sure path to calling constitutional convention, doing whatever they want. I mean, that's the Schumer said it beforehand. For every rural voter we're gonna that we lose, we're going to gain two in the two moderate Republicans in the suburbs of Philadelphia. That was their plan. It's been the plan since the DLC first came into power, and it's lost, like you said, Brandon. It's lost so much, and it's going to continue to lose. But what it does is it allows them to not capitulate uh, any any ground to the left and to still take gobs of money from their donors. So, you know, when you see these same people like Marcos, who's just a, uh, at this point, just a Dem fanboy and uh, Joanne Reed pushing this theory, they, it sounds to me like they haven't really thought it through. All they're thinking is, well, you know, this is, this will allow us and our favorite people to go. But I mean, I'm looking at the Texas election results right now, 52.2% voted for Donald Trump. And 43.2% voted for Hillary Clinton. So you're just going to abandon that 43.2% of voters who might actually need your help and would vote for you in the future to whoever? It's just, it's a bad strategy. Also the non-voters. Don't forget yeah. the non-voters. Because there's, non-voters. Been a lot, there's been a lot of strategies floated out this week about what the Democratic Party should do. And so this is just one of them, right? That they should just pack up their bag, divest from red states. Another one that you know was written by what Mark Penn and, and was it was it New York Times op ed? I want to say yeah, New York Times. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> the one that said move to the right if you want to win. No, no, yeah. It's, well it's, what's it's, interesting it's, about that is move to the uh, center. It's at center. Yeah. Which is the it was right. one that literally said Democrats, you have to have to run to the right if yes. you want to win. And I'm pretty sure that was the one in the New York Times. Yes, it was. It was Penn. And Fang, Lee Fang just reported that Penn is heavily invested in Republicans actually winning because he owns stock in a Republican think tank. I mean, of course, but like this, 
all of these things just you know smack me in the face of the Democratic Party has lo- learned the wrong lessons again, like again. It's just like like they like they, they look they look at the results of the election. They look at the you know people staying home. They look at Bernie Sanders being the most popular politician in America. They look at Jeremy Corbyn. They look at people you know in the streets for uh, single payer health care for living wages for no war in Syria, no war in in uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And no wars, they, period. No wars, period. And what they get, what they think, no fracking. What they hear is. We should become more racist, and we should get the front man of third eye blind to run to run for president. And like, yeah. But go ahead. I mean, here's the thing, though. Like, because I really want to do dig into kind of what they're talking about specifically when they say let's just divest from red states. There is no such thing as a as a blue state. The reason why you see states that are considered blue are they have heavy metropolitan areas. You see states like California, you see states like New York, you see states like Washington that have these major, major concentrations of population in urban centers, Seattle, LA, you know, New York, et cetera, that have the ability to carry an entire state. But if you want, like, when you talk about divesting, you're going to divest from Washington because the vast majority of the state is incredibly conservative. You're going to divest from Oregon. You're going to divest from large parts of California. You're going to divest from large parts of New York. And when you say that you're going to divest from these places just because they don't fit into your political views, I think that's really, like, that is showing you Republican. That's showing you don't want to win. That's showing that as far as you're concerned, your ability to profit off of an election is so much more important to you than the actual needs of the people. These people in these countries, in, in, in the more rural parts of the state, these people in these red states desperately need help. They need somebody to come in with actual ideas and say, here's how we're going to fix your problems. That is what Democrats are getting. They continue to say, oh, we're the big tent party. We're the party that cares about people. But you don't. You cannot say that and at the same time have one, because this isn't just limited to one out, one out there. This isn't limited to a couple of people in the party. This is a very, very, very widespread idea within the Democratic base. It's people that consistently vote for Democrats just on Twitter today. I was seeing uh, an interaction between Michael uh, from PA and somebody on Twitter, and her response was, "Beware of poor people with progressive uh, progressive ideations because it's really just a hustle. They just want to scam you. This is a Democrat. This is a Democrat. Like this is an issue. Y'all cannot abandon poor people because they want they they, they want the Constitution to be followed. Sorry, that's my cat. You know when it says the government will take care of the general welfare of its people." That includes uh, universal don't healthcare. You, that includes don't you, don't universal healthcare. Don't you start, don't you start quoting government. Constitution? Well, we're gonna get we're gonna get a lot of people to <laughs> say you're calling for revolution. Like, don't. <laughs> uh, don't you don't you quote the Constitution on my show? I don't I don't want to be tried for treason. You know, <laughs> right? No, but like it, 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 you make a good point, and I mean, I guess what's becoming really really clear, especially as you know what also came out yesterday were like the theoretical bumper sticker designs for the D, the DCCC. And I, I, by now, everyone is aware of that. One of them says like, you know, vote Democrat 2018. I mean, have you seen the other guys? Which was a joke I made like almost nine months ago. Like, like at that point, it was a joke. And I mean, it wasn't even a clever joke because obviously that's the Democratic Party's brand. Like we're not them. It's like, like people have made that, a lot of people who vote or no, are Democratic Party uh, loyalist or at least you know, can't, you know, cultural Democrats rather people who identify as Democrat but don't really engage with the party have started to make that realization too that Democratic Party like that like their whole their whole shtick is we're just not Republicans like like what does that mean well we can't really tell you but we're not them so you, like don't vote for them but like I think what's becoming very clear that the Democratic Party doesn't have doesn't did not have a plan a, a leadership plan sans Hillary Clinton. Like, 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 the, the idea of Hillary Clinton, you know, CAP, CAP, the near Tandons, uh, the Joy Ann Reeds, the Democratic Party, they were so banking on Hillary Clinton winning uh, that everything that, that they want to promote was predicated on her being president. Like, 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 that, like, that, like that's just what it is. Go ahead, John. So we're gonna, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Richard. Oh, yeah, that's, that's exactly where, where they left it. They had planned everything around such a thing, and they didn't also cope with or grasp the idea that if somehow she did lose, that 
then she would people would be pushing her out of the party as in like they thought that everybody would just feel sorry for her and would welcome her back with open arms like oh you know wounded champion it's not fair uh you know the sexism was just too great uh we'll we'll, we'll embrace you and turn you around next time and, and this one the third time's a charm you know that that's what they were expecting if if everything else failed or at least after the initial time of when she had lost the presidency they thought that that perhaps after some time people would be able to embrace her again but they didn't predict that there would be this strong uh, string of folks that were still upset about what had happened and how things had been handled and were not going to welcome her back either towards the presidency or let alone just to be a member of the Democratic Party. And so now she's found this place as, you know, running some super PAC uh, king or queen maker uh, organization that we'll see how that gets handled over time. But go ahead. No, I guess I guess my point was largely that like the Democrat, the Democrat Party doesn't have a bench. But they, they have literally no bench. They have they have no they have no up and coming leaders. They have no one to run. You know, well, they cleared the next... it intentionally just for fear that that person might usurp Hillary in some way, shape, or form, like uh, Obama had. Like, and so they 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 wanted to make sure it was bare. I would I would I, I, part of that I would say yes, but part of that I also want to argue is that what we're seeing is a generational shift. And a generational shift in this case is going to be a motherfucker for the Democratic Party. It's going to be a motherfucker for the Democrat for the two-party system as a whole. Because what you're seeing is a lot of people that would be those up-and-comers, a lot of those folks that would have been the people to take over the Democratic Party's leadership don't want anything to do with them. Because as we're starting to see millennials get into this group where we, we're the ones starting to run for Congress, we're the ones starting that would be starting to take over these political parties, in which in some states we're seeing in Washington, I, maybe uh, 10 or 15 millennials that I know have actually taken leadership positions within the party, we're seeing a lot less engagement because there's a fundamental difference in what we believe the government should be doing for its people. The millennials as a, as a whole are bad, are, are socialists. Millennials prefer socialism to capitalism. And so that creates a fundamental schism between us and the Democratic Party. We want to see things like we said, universal health care, which most people support. We want to see things like a universal basic income. Again, people support this. We want to see free college, et cetera, et cetera. Because of that, there is no place for these people in the Democratic Party. So because the Democratic Party won't evolve, that's part of the reason why they have no bench. They have nobody to come in and replace these outgoing leaders. Well, let me be very clear. Democratic Party is not the party of urbanites, right? I think that that, that, uh, that uh, claim by Dan yeah. Savage is inaccurate. It's like, and I actually had to look this up, right? I wanted, I wanted to look up uh, the, voting, the voting demographics for urban areas, and you know, New York City has like a 50% voter turnout for presidential election. It's like the voting turnout in urban areas is actually incredibly low for a variety. Mm -hmm. it, it's suppressed for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons being, you know, the two party system and, you know, the way in which the, the way in which uh, the winner take all system functions. Like it, 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 by, it by nature of pro suppresses the vote and disenchants voters. But like, there is such a huge dichotomy that exists in urban metropolises that are is often forgotten when we talk about the, the, the places being liberal bastions, right? It's like, and so like that's one of these issues where Democratic Party likes to present themselves as they're like, well, we're the party of the urban, the urbanites, like you know, like the you know the, the inclusive liberal cities, but New York is a shithole. It's like I live in New York City. Uh, a lot of people I know they didn't bother voting. Because frankly, they didn't see any difference between Hillary Clinton and I, I know I live in inner city New York City. They didn't see any difference between Hillary Clinton and, and uh, Donald Trump. Like I didn't feel that way, and I and I talked to a lot of them. And, and one of you, I will never forget one of you. I talked to talked to a, a a 19 year old on the day of the election, and I asked him, I'm like, hey, you know, why, like, you know, did you vote? And he was like, no, you know, this is what, I was at a gym, and I was like, I think you should vote. You should really vote. And he was, and I was like, why aren't you voting? And he's like, I'm 19. I don't want my first election to look like this. <laughs> like, I don't, Just in denial. I, I, like, no. You know, no, yeah, he was, he was like, I don't want my folks. I don't either. He's like, you know, she's going to take, she's going to take New York City anyway. I would prefer my first election not look like this. And I was like, I, because like, I mean, like, I mean, I guess he wanted to believe a little bit more in the system, right? Like he, like he wasn't like quite at that pragmatic where you gotta gotta pin, hold your nose and vote for you know the lesser of evils candidate thing. But I think that's part of the generational shift. 
Yeah. Well, I, with... I think there, there is, quickly, I just wanted to say, I think if there is a, uh, like, uh, the, a legitimate component to the urbanite idea, just in that there's a, some concentration of where Democrats typically able are able to get majorities or able to win uh, currently oh. in, in that, in that, so there's the talk of the legislators are being independently drawing the the boundaries to prevent gerrymandering and Democrats thinking that that's going to be a boon to them. But there is an actual issue of the them just losing rural parts of America all over the country and all states. So just having an indep independent person draw the boundaries isn't going to help the geographical problem that they face. When I say Democratic yeah, Party, the party. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, I was going to say, not, I'm, I'm agreeing with Richard, you know, just having yeah. an independent party drawing districts won't help at all. It's if you're not getting a message to the majority of the people, which is not the, the the small group of people that the Democrats have crafted their message for since the 80s and the birth of the DLC, you're not going to win. If you keep offering a shit sandwich, eventually people are going to yes. say, you know what, I'm going to stop going there. See, see, that's, that's, and that's my point, right? This is, and I you think can't just people... point to the, that the other one has more flies on it. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, right. It's still a shit sandwich. I'm not, I'm not fucking eating. Yeah, see, that, that's, and that's my point, right? So, like, this whole we're not the other guy strategy is not a good strategy either. Like, like, if, like if it were a good strategy, I would say, oh, okay, well, you know what? People are going to die, uh, but they might win some seats, right? But the thing is, it's not even a good strategy. Right. Like, it's not, and, and here's why. Because if people recognize, and the vote was suppressed by the la for the last eight years because President Obama offered a lot of, you know, ideas about hope and change, did not deliver on them. People like the recovery was kind of concentrated in the top one percent. A lot of people didn't notice material differences in their life. You know, if you live in Flint, Michigan, your water wasn't clean regardless. It's been like what twenty-seven years since they have clean. They've had clean water. Uh, you know, like like the idea that the other party the, that you can win elections by the other party being bad is not necessarily a bad idea. But you still have to have a proactive message because if you prove yourself to be materially useless, like if you go out there and say, okay, the other party is bad, notice how bad they are. People are not going to vote for them, but they're also not going to vote for you because you've proven that like, when you're in power, you're not good. It's like, like, like you're still bad. Like, like, I, they, they, they won't come to you to solve your problems if you're not offering an actual solution to their problems. Right, and, and that's exemplified by the ACA versus the AHCA. I mean, Matt Bruning did that great graph. 650,000 people will die by 2025 if we go with the AHCA, but 450,000 people will die by 2025 if we continue with the ACA. Single payer? No, nah, that, that, nobody. Now, we're not talking about anything other than deaths attributed to lack of access to health care. So why is it that the Democrats aren't pushing for single payer? Because that's a material change that would cost money and their donors don't want it. So again, we got a shit sandwich for you, and we're not going to affect any material changes in your life, but we're not quite as bad as Republicans. It's not a winning message. It's like, but we put some cucumber on it, though. <laughs> like, right. So. I mean, that's, that's kind of what they're trying to sell, and that's also, a big part. And there's someone in the chat, I want to make sure I their name right real quick. Uh, ben Weissman said, people don't understand that the working class is not just white people, and neither are rural areas. Nothing wrong with whites, but something to point out. But I think that is a really good idea. It, it, it's something that's very important. To, it is very important to point out. Because there is a fundamental difference between talking to working class and poor people and talking specifically to working class poor whites, or rather in the Democrats' case, not talking to them. Like specifically cutting these people out because like Brandon has said, they feel that they have these, they, they, they really do represent the aristocracy in these coastal cities, in these urban in these urban areas, the urban elites. They represent that group of people and that group of people alone. So for the Democrats to do anything, Democrats to move forward, they have to fundamentally change the message. And the problem is they don't want to. They don't want to stop being the shit sandwich because as far as they're concerned, well, enough people vote for us that we won two presidential elections by saying, look, the other guy's worse. Just because they didn't win this time against arguably the worst candidate in history doesn't matter. They, they didn't Facts win. don't matter to these people. It's dogmatic at this point. They didn't win those two elections because of that, though. They won, they won, Obama won the first election because he had, like, a legitimate, you know, pseudo-populist message that, like, kind of tricked people. They won the second election because Mitt Romney is about, is about as exciting as, as clipping your toenails is. Wait, and I, I, really, really, I just want to mention that. That's not what we heard. Like, that's not what we heard from local parties. What we heard was Mitt Romney's, we heard that John McCain is racist and that Mitt Romney is too rich to deal with you guys, even though Obama's rich as hell. 
right? That's what I was told out here in Washington State. That's what they were campaigning on. They weren't campaigning on Obama's hope and change. They were campaigning on he's black and he's not the other guy. That's what John they McCain campaigned was, on. John McCain was never was never a challenge to President Obama uh, getting elected. Hillary Clinton was. Hillary Clinton was a much bigger was a much bigger obstacle to overcome than, than John McCain ever was going to be. I just want to say McCain, quickly that that neither party is looking out for poor people, is like, especially for people that are not able to get a job. Like if you can't work, nobody's arguing for you. It's always working poor or the people that have jobs and all that stuff. And so it was like the the folks that are out there that are just struggling on their own and aren't able to aren't able to get employed and aren't working in. Uh, most of the time that there's nobody really advocating for them as far as the party goes. So I just wanted to add that in. Well, no, so like, that's, why, that's, what, that's what I was going to say earlier. The Democratic Party is not the party of, ur- of urbanites. They're the party of like upper middle class urbanites. They're, they're the party of gentrifiers and, you know, CEOs who live in New York City. Because, uh, you know, a lot of the urbanites, you know, the black, the black, the black urbanites, the uh, poor, you know, the lower, the, you know, the working poor in cities, like they were left unaffected by this, the pseudo recovery. Right. Oh yeah. And so, and so, like, if you look at the, if you look at the demographics, like, right, they get. In New York City, I would say New York City has the best and worst schools. Like, has the best and worst school districts in America, and it, it all, it all has to do with the way wealth, wealth is concentrated in the cities. And so, we you know, we, so we get to this point where the Democratic Party is is claiming they represent they represent that their path to victory is urban centers, but they don't even really represent all of urbanites. It's like they they represent a, you know they represent a very small population of cosmopolitan people. Very true. I mean, again, but this is something I feel like we've talked, uh, talked about a bunch on the show, at least in the past, is Democrats don't give a fuck about poor people. Nobody in, po- nobody in these political spheres actually cares about poor people. All they care about is one re-election and two, how much money can they make. That's really all that matters to them. All that matters to the, uh, to the, to the Democratic and Republican uh, National Committee is how much money can we make. That's all any of these people care about. They don't care about any of these issues. So when they talk, when they come out and they campaign on this stuff, it's just a lot of times it's it's platitudes. It's we're going to sell you this idea, but we're not actually going to do anything about it. So until there's a fundamental shift, we won't see anything change. Or we won't see any actual representation for regular, everyday, average people in Congress. And I say that as someone who's lived both in an urban center and who now currently lives in a rural area. There's no jobs. There, there's just not. People talk about, oh, there's all these jobs, the recovery this, the recovery that, the recovery here. There's really not. And then when you start parsing it down into different sectors, when you talk about people of color, you talk about college students, you talk about X, Y, and Z, it gets even more complicated as to who has the jobs and who doesn't. One of the things that we're hearing out here is just from being around other college students is a lot of college students of color are being passed over for some of their white peers. While that's happening, college students in general aren't getting jobs in favor of people that lost their jobs during the recession who have been who have 20, 30 plus years of work experience and are willing to work at whatever job they can get. That also complicates the job market. So there's all these different factors that nobody wants to talk about. They just want to say, well, look at the jobs report or look at the lack of jobs in this jobs report, but none of them actually wants to get down and solve the issue. One of the things the government should guarantee is, is work. If you're an able if you're even if you're a disabled person, if you're a person in the United States and you're a citizen and you want to work, the government should have a job for you in the discussion. Well, I mean, see, I, I bring the three of things. Nick had on the takedown about that, too. I'm sure he'd like to hear, hear you support no, go, that. Go ahead, John. Yeah, John. I was saying there's plenty of things that we can be doing, too. I mean, you look at the state of the roads. I mean, if anyone wants a job, union jobs can be doing road construction actually pay really fucking well. And yet we're not doing any of that work. And that's kind of my field. What I did for a long time was construction like that. Um it wasn't quite like that. I mean, granted, I was doing slightly different on the water, but, you know, those jobs, that infrastructure repair and those jobs are needed. And yet we don't fund them. And now you have Trump talking about this infrastructure bill where he's actually just giving like a massive tax break and incentivizing and privatization to major corporations in order to sell this as jobs. And the Democrats have nothing. The only one who's pushing back on it is Bernie because you know, the donors are going to make out like bandits in this and the Democrats aren't really pushing back on it, much like they're not pushing back on how he's going to pay for some of it with reimportation of tax free money overseas. So it's their message sucks. They're not doing what they need to do and they're going to continue doing that. Like Adair said, they care about money and secondary. I'd say they care about reelection only because it's a way for them to make more money. 